My name is Sam Turco. I'm a professor of biochemistry at the University of Kentucky Medical School. I've been a professor there for over 30 years and I'm the course director for the first year uh, medical biochemistry course. Uh, and I've been involved with teaching medical students for obviously many, many years. I've been associated with Kaplan Medical for 12 years. Uh, I've been to a lot of different places and talked to a lot of different students over the years and it's been a pleasure and an honor to be associated with Kaplan Medical. Today we're going to be talking about uh, carbohydrate metabolism. Chapters 12 through 18 deal with metabolic pathways and the first three chapters deal with carbohydrate metabolism. And chapter 12 deals primarily with this very important carbohydrate pathway called glycolysis. And also in this chapter, we'll be talking about several other carbohydrates like galactose metabolism and fructose metabolism. But first, we want to talk about uh, glucose metabolism. Now, glycolysis is a pathway which a lot of students over the years, they've said, oh, I heard this pathway so many times in this course, that course, they hear about this pathway all the time, and a lot of students are sick of hearing about glycolysis. But in my opinion, I think a lot of students don't appreciate what this pathway does. In your lifetime as a physician, you're unlikely to see uh, hardly any patients who have a complete enzyme defect in glycolysis, and the reason is a complete enzyme defect of any of the 10 steps, any of the 10 enzymes in glycolysis results in lethality. So in your career, you may see a patient who has a defect in glycolysis, but that's due to a partial enzyme defect of a gene involved in encoding an enzyme in glycolysis. In fact, in this pathway, we'll, we, we will be talking about uh, one disease in which uh, people have a partial enzyme defect, not a complete enzyme defect. And this brings up an issue is in your profession uh, of pathology, where do you see diseases? You see diseases in metabolic pathways where you can have a complete enzyme defect. But those pathways are not essential for life. A complete enzyme defect, but people still live. It may not be good life. For example, in galactosemia, you can have a complete enzyme defect of several of the enzymes in that metabolic pathway, but people still live. But in glycolysis, a complete enzyme defect is incompatible with life. Partial enzyme defects do exist. So, if, so before we get to the pathway of glycolysis, what I first like to do is, is to, to initiate this chapter is first talk about what happens when a person eats a high carbohydrate meal and talk about the, the, the digestion process of, of eating a high carb meal. So, in, in, so if we were to eat a high carbohydrate meal, of that high carbohydrate meal, for example, if you eat a breakfast consisting of pancakes and, pancakes and syrup, cereal with milk, waffles, donuts, uh, bagels, something along that line. How does your body process that carbohydrate? Now, of all that high carbohydrate meal, if you were asked the question, what percent of the high carbohydrate meal is free glucose? And the answer is hardly any is free glucose, even though uh, there, there might be a little bit of glucose around, a little bit of galactose around, but most of that uh, high carbohydrate meal is not free glucose. So what is that high carbohydrate meal? that you and I uh, like to eat? And the answer is most of the high carbohydrate meal is made up of starch, which is glucose, alpha-1,4 glucose, alpha-1,4 glucose, alpha-1,4 glucose, and every so often there might be an alpha-1,6 linked glucose. So that's what starch is, made up of um, amylose and amylopectin uh, th th in lots of the wheat and barley and rye that we all eat. Um, now, and also in this meal of the high carbohydrate meal, the cereal will be, uh, a lot of uh, sucrose will be in that meal, in the cereal and, and other um, sweet stuff that we have, and bagels and so on. And then because there's milk around, there will be a lot of lactose uh, in the milk. So the issue is then how does the body uh, digest this high carbohydrate meal? So when the food enters the mouth, there is an enzyme that, that comes into play, and the enzyme is salivary amylase. Now the salivary amylase uh, is an enzyme which will, which, which will start breaking down the starch randomly and breaking glucose alpha-1,4 glucose bonds. So starch will be broken down randomly. There'll be no um, uh, breakdown of the sucrose or the lactose in the mouth. And then when the food enters the uh, stomach, the, there's no further breakdown of the high carbohydrate meal. And in fact, the low pH of the stomach uh, 
will kill the salivary amylase. So no further breakdown goes on in the stomach. When the food enters the intestine, an enzyme kicks in, uh, and that enzyme is uh, pancreatic amylase. Now what pancreatic amylase does, it just finishes the job that the salivary amylase started, just hacks away at all those uh, glucose alpha-1,4 glucose bonds. And, it, and when pancreatic amylase is finished working, at that point there, what, uh, what resides in the intestine is, uh, are the disaccharides, maltose, isomaltose, sucrose, and lactose. And what mal maltose is, is glucose alpha-1,4 glucose. What isomaltose is, is glucose alpha-1,6 glucose. What, fruct what uh, sucrose is, is made up of fructose and glucose. And lactose is made up of galactose and glucose. Now we'll talk about sucrose and lactose later. But what happens uh, there in the, in the lumen of the intestine, there are a series of uh, brush border disaccharidases maltase, isomaltase, sucrase, and lactase that just now takes the disaccharides and breaks them down to the monosaccharides. And at this stage here, primarily uh, the sugar, the monosaccharide, is glucose. Over 99% of, of the monosaccharides being generated in the lumen of the intestine is glucose and very little galactose and very little fructose. They will be present because of the sucrose and lactose that happen to be around in that meal. But, so we're going to concentrate on the glucose. So the idea next is what happens to all that glucose that's generated in the lumen of the intestine? Disaccharides cannot be absorbed. This is a big difference between disaccharides and peptides. Peptide, dipeptides and tripeptides can be absorbed, but, but disaccharides cannot. That's why they have to be broken down to the monosaccharides. Now regarding the monosaccharide glucose, how does it get into the mucosal cell? How is it absorbed? And the answer is it gets absorbed by uh, an active transport system. And the active transporter is the sodium glucose transporter. And, and, to, and so glucose is moving up a concentration gradient. So if on a national board they ask, what's the direct source of the energy that powers glucose up a concentration gradient into the mucosal cell? You do not answer ATP. ATP is indirect source of the energy. The direct source of the energy that powers glucose moving up a concentration gradient is the sodium gradient. Sodium is moving down a concentration gradient. Any gradient has energy. And because sodium is moving down a concentration gradient, that energy that was in the sodium gradient is then transferred to the glucose gradient, and then glucose is moving up a concentration gradient, and the energy comes from the sodium um, moving down that concentration gradient. So glucose is moved into the mucosal cell, and once glucose gets into the mucosal cell, on the serosal side of the mucosal cell, there are passive transporters that get glucose from the mucosal cell into the bloodstream. So now glucose enters the blood. And so depending on how much, high, how much of a high carbohydrate meal that we eat, glucose now will be pouring into the bloodstream. And so what I'd like to do next is discuss and review the, the all-important glucose tolerance curve. So if you were to ask a question, what does the glucose tolerance curve look like? Well, you would say, well, here on the y-axis is blood glucose concentration. On the x-axis is, is time. And so, uh, and now what is the basal uh, level of glucose in the blood? And the basal level of glucose in the blood is 5 millimolar. And so, uh, if you eat a high carbohydrate meal, then blood glucose will start to rise. So, what does a glucose tolerance curve look like? And you would say, well, it's a bell shaped curve in which glucose now starts to rise in the blood. And then, after it reaches a maximum, it then starts coming back down to normal and, it, uh, and at 5 millimolar. And that is normal transient hyperglycemia. Now, how high that, that peak spikes depends on how much sugar we eat in this high carbohydrate meal. It can really go up depending if we eat uh, one donut versus five donuts. And it'll peak up, and, but eventually it comes back down to normal. So now, what is the x-axis? What is the units there? When does it reach a maximum, and when does it come back down to, to normal? And is it minutes, hours, or days? And the answer is it reaches a maximum in about 45 minutes and comes back down to normal in about 90 minutes. Now, everybody's a little different, 
but for the purposes of this review, we'll say when you eat a high carbohydrate real meal, it reaches a maximum at 45 minutes. At 90 minutes post eating the high carb meal, blood glucose is back down to normal. Again, everybody's a little bit different, but we'll say 90 minutes after that high carb meal comes back down to normal. So if this is the normal um, uh, glucose tolerance curve, then what does the, uh, the glucose tolerance curve look like for a diabetic? And the answer is, well, uh, if a diabetic with either type 1 or type 2 is not, uh, taking, uh, does not have the insulin effect, then if they eat a, some kind of carbohydrate, a chocolate bar, something along that line, that blood glucose now will start to rise. Uh, it starts off higher than the 5 millimolar, and it'll start to rise in response to that high carbohydrate meal. And then at 45 minutes, when it reaches its maximum, what happens after that 45 minutes? And the answer is blood glucose will slowly come back down to normal, but not quite at the, at, as fast as it does uh, in the normal situation. So, the, so, which brings up the issue is, what is insulin doing in, 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 in the normal situation? Is insulin having everything to do with blood glucose coming back down to normal? And the answer is no, because in a diabetic situation, it still starts to come back down, but at a much slower rate. So, if the question is, what is insulin doing in the normal situation, you would say insulin has a lot to do with the removal of glucose out of the blood, but not solely responsible for removing that glucose out of the blood. Why not solely responsible? Because there are insulin independent cells in your body. For example, the brain, erythrocytes, and so on, that are always removing glucose out of the blood at a very steady pace. But insulin has a lot to do with it because of the insulin dependent tissues uh, that we'll talk about in a little bit. But so in a diabetic situation, it starts to come back down. But as you might imagine, before a uh, diabetic, before that blood glucose would ever get, come back down to normal, a diabetic would probably eat, get hungry, eat something else. And that, in that situation there, the, the, the glucose curve would go, start to go back up again. And then reach a maximum and slowly kept, come back down. But again, as time goes on, that blood glucose is out in the bloodstream at a very high concentration for extended periods of time. Now that brings up another very important issue about diabetes. It, it, that extra glucose that's in the blood uh, for extended periods of time, that extra glucose is going to be responsible for most of the pathology associated with diabetes. In, in, in the, in, in the, what I mean by that is in a diabetic state, where do you see pathology? You don't see pathology in the insulin dependent tissues. And what are the insulin dependent tissues? There are three of them. There's the liver, adipocyte, and the muscle. And you don't see pathology, generally speaking, in diabetics in those three tissues, which are insulin dependent. You see, you see pathology in insulin independent tissues, like cataracts, uh, renal failure, vascular problems, and the reason for that, the basis, the biochemistry behind that pathology in the insulin independent tissues is because that extra glucose in the blood for, for extended periods of time, that extra glucose out there will, will start to latch on to amino groups of proteins. For example, the, 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 alpha, the glucose will latch on to the amino groups of hemoglobin, forming hemoglobin A1C that we'll be talking about later on. So the extra glucose out in the blood, that aldehyde group of glucose will latch onto amino groups of proteins, starting to cause havoc to the vascular system and, and giving rise to a lot of pathology associated with diabetes. But coming back to the normal situation, when, so when blood glucose reaches a maximum 45 minutes and comes back down to normal in 90 minutes, again, insulin has a lot to do with that, but not solely responsible for that. Now another issue here is that that vertical white line that you see there, that arrow that you see here. At 90 minutes post high carbohydrate meal, that, that vertical line is so important to your body. And what I mean by that is the metabolic pathway is going on for the first 90 minutes of eating that high carbohydrate meal to the left of that vertical white arrow are vastly different going on in your body compared to the right of that vertical arrow. And, and, re and the reason for that is notice here, when blood glucose comes back to normal at 90 minutes, notice it does not keep going down. And so what happens is there are other metabolic pathways kick in at that 90 minute time point to, to try to maintain that blood glucose at 90, at, at uh, 90 milligrams per deciliter, which is the same thing at, as 
uh, 5 millimolar. So a very, very important issue, that vertical white line. The metabolic pathways to the left are vastly different than to the right. And we're going to spend a lot of time talking about that very issue.